Sorry. You're leaving this room, I can't. Peace. Yep. We're good? Yep, good to go. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so this is a workshop on uh, fluoridation um, in response to a letter from the Director General of Health as they proceed through the um, the legislative change that central government made around fluoridation of public water supplies. So this is a sort of the next step in that process um, that they're rolling out around various TAs around New Zealand. So Mike will take us, Mike Williams, uh, Group Manager, Infrastructure and Services, uh, will take us through the, the workshop for information today. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, thank you, councillors and campaign. Um, I'm sure how familiar each of you are with the new requirements um, from the Act that was passed in um, November 21 um, with Health, Director General of Health now becoming the mandated person that can make um, demands on any of the water supply services. And as Fuller District Council supplies water to a number of our um, communities, um, we have been deemed as a supplier. So in November 21, the Director General put out a, um, a mandate or a request to 14 councils, and they range from the far north um, through New Zealand, and 14 of those people, have been, those communities or those councils have now fluoridated some of their systems that, that were required to be fluoridated or going through the process of that. And the third, on the 3rd of November 22, 12 months later, we received a letter from the Director General um, indicating that we would be one of 27 further councils that would be asked to supply information by the 2nd of February to give them feedback on how much it will cost and what would be the delivery time for us to supply fluoridation to our Westports water supply and our reef and water supply. After talking with Jamie and um, Sharon at the time and now Rachel, we decided it's probably a good time because a lot of the councillors here weren't familiar with the first tranche of fluoridation that went through and just going back through the processes of um, what we as a council need to do and have to do moving forward. So, with the various amounts of letters that we've received and information we've received from the Director General and the Ministry of Health, what, we're, what we've discovered in reading the Act is that the first thing is that the Director General has the ability to mandate for any of the councils to do put fluoridation into the water. Um, it's non-negotiable. They've also mandated in there or put into their um, Act that councils don't have to consultate with any of our communities, um, which is goes against probably what the LGNZ requirements are for councils to go back to, to around consultation with our communities. What's really come out of this is the short time, well, it's not a short time frame, but the time frame spans over a holiday period, which the 2nd of February for us to reply to them is reasonable for us because we can tell them how long it will take and how much it's going to cost for each of those supplies. So that's the easy part for us, but what it's limited um, if this council wanted to discuss um, going out to consultation because it will, the information will have gone back prior to that. At that point, I might just, just note and stress that the, the letter that we have been sent that we have to respond to by the 2nd of February next year simply asks us to tell the Director General what it would cost and how long it would take. So it is not asking to agree or disagree to it being done. It's not actually asking for a decision of council. It's a very operational response by the 2nd of February to simply give some figures, some money figures and some time frames. As part of this process, we've been engaged, we engaged with Urpro, who's a consultant, um, water consultant that we use quite a bit in, in Westport. Um, they've come back to us with some indicative costs and the team, Rory and Mel, have come back with some indicative timeframes. So our estimate of what we will reply back to 
um, Ministry of Health on the 2nd of February or prior to the 2nd of February will be that it will, there will be 24 months um, of work to build the appropriate sheds to house this um, facility in, have the SCADA and the electronics set up into it, plus the, the original setup and testing regime that will be required prior to it going live into the community. The costs um, are indicative at this stage, but they're around $400,000 to $460,000 um, for each of the two sites to be um, set up properly. And that's with having the electronics, having the buildings. Um, what hasn't been really finalised is the ongoing costs um, for, for the OPEC side of this into the future. We've got an indicative of $17,000 to $20,000 for chemicals on an ongoing basis. The team believes that our current and our new contract that um, Council signed um, off on last two weeks ago um, will cover enough of the labour to do the weekly tests, weekly updates and to make sure everything's working. So there won't be a, a, a lot of additional costs, there'll be just an amendment to the, to the contract. Um, Really, uh, what I'm really after from the councillors, or from councillors, are uh, do you have any questions that you would like to further understand in this that we can best help with, or are you quite happy with this? Because um, it's really just an information thing more than anything else. Right, so, councillors, no, just did you say four hundred thousand to set up? To, to, yeah, to, to put all of the equipment into place, build a new shed, put the foundations down, have a have a secure hazard um, environment created, and put all of the scatter and all of the other stuff. Okay, on. and seventeen thousand for chemicals. Seventeen thousand dollars an ongoing cost per per yeah, annum. So, and where would this money come from? Is it going to be ratepayers? Or is it going to be from government through So at the moment, the coronation or the fluoridation part of the business, they have a fund available um, that we will have to put, put an application in for to, to understand that. At the moment, they've indicatively, indicatively suggested that it's about $250,000 per site. We've, um, we understand that it's actually more than that. Um, we're doing our homework a bit better. And we will be putting the appropriate numbers forward, plus <coughs> based on current situations about getting contractors, getting materials and all of this. So we're, we're adding a 35% contingency on top of, of this because that's what we're finding in all of our projects at the moment that we're escalating um, quite considerably just through being able to purchase, being able to have contractors available. Councillor Webb. Um, you talked about the first lot of councils that have been mandated and you said that they're all complied or well, in the, or full in the process. process. So, there, so there obviously was no, you know, council saying no, we won't or going against that. To be fair, we don't really, we're not, we're, un, I don't believe council are uh, able to protest okay, against yeah. it. The, the, the act is quite clear in, in, in what, the expectations are, and as a council, we have no pushback on Power. that. Okay. No. And my other question was, when you talk about chlorination as well, would that be done if this was to go through at the same time? I know it's a different issue, but we've already had the letter thinking about Reefton's um, letter about chlorination and that. Would that yeah. happen similarly? Yeah. yeah. So in Reefton's case, yes. In, in Westport's case, we're already have coronation. Okay. Oh, oh, oh sorry, yeah. So Reefton's going to be coronated by next year, probably April, May. This yeah. doesn't need to be done for two years. So it'll be done as a simple process. Like so just as we have an instruction already to... So already, so that the public know that we'll have chlorine in our water in April, by April next yeah. year. Yeah, that's been put out. Around anyway. anyway. Yes. Okay. If I just on Okay. Good to know. Okay. Can you fluoridate without chlorinating? Unknown, um, to be fair, and because fluoride is in our current water now, so we can still fluoridate without chlorination. Yes, I believe you can. 
Councillor Howard. I mean, um, should three waters not pack it up? I'm probably more concerned about the ongoing um, costs. So, would for this capital investment, would we have depreciation or what? Um, is my annual price cost? towards um, the capital outlay for the fluoridation plant. And also, I think it's most importantly is the overall operational cost, because it seems to be a lot of council time involved around the monitoring and recording and the actual process of the fluoridation. Most of the fluoridation would just be done on the land. So they're chlorine right now, I can tell you that our chlorine levels across our reservoir just is done by SCALA. So fluoridation will always be the same. And most of this will be ducks. So in terms of the half and cure chemicals, I wouldn't say operator time or council time would be overly that much more significant than now. For the benefit of councillors, can you yeah. explain SCADA? Uh, so <laughs> pretty much everything that happens at the water treatment plant, you have, I don't know, so you get data every minute from the UV or UV doses, every bit of water that comes from the treatment plant that goes into the, like, goes into the reservoir. It will tell me the pH of the water, the chlorine concentration of the water, and everything going into the reservoir is the same thing. So that all has minute readings. So effectively, under the standards, the chlorine has to be between that barrier, up between the range. And then fluorine's got about, I think, 0 0.7 to about 1.1. And that will just be automatically told to us through our system. So it's just an analyzer automatically. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of. Um... In the in the report, there seemed to be a lot around the mixing though and the unloading that side side of things. It sort of made us out as sound as if weekly was quite a um, a lot of additional work. Is that not so? Well, there'd be the additional upfront work just to install the mixing, but that would be all under that first capital investment, and that'll be covered largely by the fluoride pump. And then all the monitoring, the afterwards part is. Work. So the initial setup is going to, and, and the, the balancing of the fluoridation into the system will be a time to upfront cost, and that will be um, applied as part of our initial cost for the fund from government so that they that it's all paid up front by then. And then if it doesn't go over to Three Waters, which comes back to your original question, if it doesn't get handed over to Three Waters, all well, the district will be up for materials cost, but also um, any additional variation costs that may go into the West Reef um, Three Waters contract. Councillor Weston was next. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah it's, uh, I noticed uh, a while ago that some of the, the councils that were fluoridating when either were being picked up that they either weren't doing it or weren't doing it properly. And it's been noted by the government and they've, they've picked up on those councils from my understanding, talking to some of the other councils, one of the councils that was picked up um, well into the water. Yeah. Councillor Grafton. So is government only asking for Westport and Grafton? Out of our water supply, yeah. yes. There's 27 other councils we must as well. So why only Westport and Grafton? They're the only, to my understanding, they've got the highest populations and it's based on a population yeah. um, outcome more than an individual water supply outcome. Deputy Mayor Nail, oh, sorry, yeah, um, Councillor Nail. You, you said that this, um, you know, this is a directive, sort of algorithm of the directive, so there's no consultation required, but is, is there anything that could stop the council from consulting anyway with our community about that? No, and I was asked that question this, this morning, and under the LGNZ, we can go out for consultation, yeah. but as I, as I previously stated, the consultation process that we would probably have with our community would be outside of the delivery yeah. date of the information that I need. Yeah. yeah. So, and you also talked about it, the likely capital cost of 400000 plus. So... The funds you talked about 250,000 there is in this, so there could be a deficit between what we get, or are they going to 100 percent fund? My understanding is 100 percent fund from the from central government, but it's 11.3 million dollars that they put up for the first tranche of funding, so I'm not sure what they'll be putting up for the second. And the unlikely uh, order of us having to pay then that obviously going to mean a water rate rise. 
um, for those two for those two communities. Deputy Mayor Pesha. Is this part of the, the um, total New Zealand fluoridation project? So, so we've been chosen to be the next priority. And yes, we have. Because of the quality of our water. I, I, I can't understand. I don't understand what the selection process was, but we have been selected in this round. So 14 were the originals, and they went through those. Um, and the, the, where the, the second tranche of 27, there'll be, there'll be further tranches after the summer season. Yep. Councillor Reedy. Thank you. Um, just going back, Rory, regarding uh, SCAR or SCADA, uh, just for the benefit of everybody, that's uh, just a, I think the word is a acronym for uh, which engineers use both in uh, power, electricity, water, the whole lot. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Rory. And the second question I've got, uh, Mr. Mayor, is just, it's, it's only a question. Uh, I seem to recall some discussion about Karamea water supply uh, from the school uh, to the camp, from the school to the Camden ground and stuff like that. I'm just, when we're talking about fluoridation, I'm just not sure because we're supplying a certain number of uh, houses or uh, residents, we are considered a supplier. So you're talking about, uh, might just uh, whisper and reef at the moment, but are the likes of the, uh, the Karameas and the uh, and that, when will they be included? Again, it comes down to a volume of people in the community. Um, it's based on a number, and the yeah. government may decide on the other water supplies in the future. At the moment, this is, they're doing it based on a population of over five. Yeah. I think they're doing it. So they have a list of water supplies, and yeah. they to small, very small, small, medium, large, and large, not like that. That's not the current thing. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm like, so, no, so I'm just a little confused about the Karamea one, just for the about the school and the. Can, can you recall that discussion? I can give you make a correction again. Yeah. The council just had nothing to do with it. Um, the school, the Ministry of Education, school, yeah. the standalone because we agreed not to go with it. And the domain, which is council, we've got a new system, and, and whatever comes along, they'll be able to fit it on themselves. Yes. And they'll be fine. You self manage by that's all bad, based on your, uh, your numbers as provided by government. So, yes. so and this will become a standard requirement of a water supply. It's not like going to sit out of some special thing on its own, eventually, it will just be another. Compliance thing that whoever the supplier is, whether that's council in the future or it will, go to the, it will become a requirement to yes. supply. But both of those plants have made um, set up for any addition we need them. Councillor Nail? We had a, in the letter that you received, is there a rationale behind the need to fill um, I think the, the letters are in your um, folders yeah. and there's no real rationale behind it at all. It's just it is that you have been selected. Just to further answer that, this book is, as we talked previously, is an area of really low decile people. And so the government will be looking at is getting really good thing there, but because we have a huge amount of young people at high risk of deep carries in this yeah, quite highly deprived environment. So it's a way of, I guess, protecting our most, most vulnerable people and kind of making it equitable so that poorer people don't have more deep costs down the line. So the government are getting a really good back for their back here because it's a health initiative that will have a huge payback later on. That's how I see it. And, and as, you, as you rightly said, it's about low decile towns and, and communities that are being probably chosen more or areas that, that are easily to pop more population that has that in as well. Um, we pulled off some statistics out of the house out of the site um, this morning in regards to that. And yes, we are one of the low decels. Um, I think um, far north is probably the, the top of the list. We're, 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 I think we were second. Yeah, just through the chair, you see, um, you know, also reasonably high percentage of two and five and eight year old children. So, you know, really good question is why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Councillor Howard. Just reiterating what, what's been said there, I know um, a couple of years ago as well, DHB's 
I think three, number three sort of priority was under poor dental health was so poor. But um, but looking at it big areas, I'm just thinking, wondering, uh, maybe under the localities project whether we should be looking at the dental care and our most deprived, like northern bullet areas, um, what what opportunities come up that we may be able to um, support better dental health, whether it's education or just um, prioritising it for the localities. Mm -hmm. yep. So we. So will the council be um, making a statement, I guess, saying, you know, there's obviously a lot of public interest about this and people, a lot of people expressing that they don't want fluoride added to the water supply. So is the response going back that our hands are tight, you know, this is, we can consult and if everybody came back and said we don't want to fluoride, we can't actually do anything about that. It's my understanding. That's why I'm not sure the benefit of a consultation because there is, we're not actually asking do we don't we because the government have decided that. Yeah. So it's in the change to the health act, was it? Yeah. And so I guess the response around that, if, people, if then it falls back into household health, how they respond to that and the fact that they don't drink or, you know, they find an alternative water, you know, bottled water or whatever water source to not drink the water basically when it comes to a personal choice. So outcome from this workshop then is, the, is just the response to the two questions that the DG of Health asked. Correct. Yep. Yep, so the, the point of today was just simply for information because many of you are, are new faces around the table and we do understand that this is a contentious issue in the community. So we wanted to take that opportunity to bring you up to date on that information, make you aware of what it is that's been asked and what it is that hasn't been asked, just before that response goes back in February. Uh, so I'm sort of the horses already involved here, but there, there are members of the community who are involved in the Strictly speaking, in this instance, council is not being asked to make a decision. So normally, council consultation processes under the Local Government Act relate to council decision making. Here, this wouldn't be a decision of council. This would be a directive from our regulator. And in terms of the, the response on the 2nd of February, which is all we're tracking to at the moment, remembering that no decision has been made. We've simply been sent a signal that says you are being thought of for a directive to fluoridate these two water supplies and asked to provide that information. So at this stage, that is all that we are doing. In terms of opening up that debate for the community and council leading that debate, there is very little we could offer the community by way of an outcome because council is not the decision maker. So it may be that council is not the most appropriate vehicle to have that debate through, if that makes sense. So where should people lead to then in terms of wanting to have that debate? I mean, you know, in a wider sense, we've been um, given the responsibility about the well-being of our community. And so some people are saying, well, you're not looking after my well-being, or are a So there must, should we direct them to the steps of Parliament, or, or are we going to give them an opportunity? I mean, they can turn up at the Parliament Forum, and, and I guess that's what people are looking for. They're looking for a vehicle to say, well, this might be a direct down at the top, but we won't have a say. And that opportunity to have that say was when the, the Health Act was changed and that ability to give those directives or give them in that particular way was put into legislation. Yeah, I don't know that uh, not many people understood the implications of the time and the speed committee and if they were into us in the committee. Uh, and so do we just simply say to them, sorry, you missed the vote, go away. And at the end of the day, you can have those conversations with your community members and make them aware of what, what the facts are, yeah. which is, again, this is, this is what our yeah. regulator is, is directing. We can certainly, if council would like, we could put a comment into the letter when we are referring, uh, sorry, responding with that very fact, those very fact-based statements, again, acknowledging we haven't had the consultation. Some are for, some are against, yeah. some are very yeah. neutral. We could put a statement in saying that, you know, well, we have not 
consulted with the community because this is not a decision of council. We do note that there are differing views in the community and we wish to bring that to your attention that not all in our community support fluoridation of the water. So if, if there was a, a direction um, yeah, through map and direct staff to include that in I will say that I am pro fluoride. But there is a view out there that needs to be. Yeah. Any pressure. I just think that it's not their first rodeo, and I think you could put that in there, but I think they'd be naive to think that that wasn't the case already. Um, and also, I think we'd be naive to think because we've, we've been asked to make the price of that it's actually not going ahead. You know, I think as soon as you put it out there and it becomes public fear, uh, you know, it becomes public knowledge, so you'd be naive that it's going to happen. So, you know, a decision has been made really. It's just that this is the first part of that decision. It's just to price it up. So, you know, I think we just need to understand that it is made. And people can have their say, but I guess sometimes you have to say in your way. Um, but, you know, people have the right to say probably what they want to say. But in this case, it's not going to change out. I don't believe it will. It didn't change it for the last 14 councils, yeah. the first 14 councils. Yes, the, the actives. Right. And specifically, well, the active itself says you are quite constant. I think that's on the assumption mm. that that won't change the outcome. So, specifically, what that is more, I guess. Yeah. <coughs> um, the time is over here now. Okay. Well, I have no issue with that, with that additional. Our grapple with is that effect being added. Um, and I guess in terms of advocacy for the community, I mean, they're, they're welcome to write to council if they want to use council as a vehicle. And that correspondence came through me and it will come through the council agenda and we can deliberate on a response. Um, my gut feeling is the response will be, well, actually, the health act says this. But that will be, I guess, other than that, they write to their MPs um, and participate in the legislative process that, that is higher up the chain. Mm -hmm. We'll leave that into our okay. reply letter prior to going out. So are there any other questions um, in regards to the fluoridation that we can enlighten anybody on that we are able to, or are we happy with the workshop to, to, come, to you know, come to an end now? Oh. oh, just one thing, just um, this is out there and reported, but whether there's a media or is just some sort of uh, notification out about, about exactly what we're discussing and what the purpose is, and we're going to really got to say just to... media in the house. Yeah. And I think we have issued a shooter. <laughs> there was a, there was a, an email that went out, but we can re reiterate that again. Actually, have been some some concert, but actually, yeah. the, the workshop and yes, that Alan was present as well. I just want to um, make a point too that um, a lot of people have really appreciated the fact that we've live streamed the workshop. So, okay. Well, if there's nothing the further, we will call that down. Yep, call the workshop to an end. Shut down the live stream. Thank you, everyone. Anyone who was watching. <laughs>